the sorry to say A pink moon is on its way None of you stand so tall A pink moon gonna get you all It's a pink moon Yeah, it's a pink moon Okay, here we are today at the Guitar Show channel, your favourite YouTube channel, of course. And I'm here with my my friend and a longtime partner in crime, Bob. How how you doing, Bob? Hello. Um, do you like my uh, Do you like my Zoom background? I certainly do. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that? Why that photo, Bob? Well, this is who we're going to be talking about today, isn't it? This is, it is right. Yes, the yes, legendary Nick Drake, and this is not a particularly uh, clear photograph. It's a bit grainy. But it's of him uh, behind one of the lowest ponds uh, on Hampstead Heath. Um, and this is a photo shoot done in the early part. No, sorry, the late part, I think, of 71. So it, this was his last photo shoot, wasn't it? I think it was one of the last photo shoots. Yeah. And he wasn't in a very good state. Uh, he was pretty, pretty maudlin frame of mind. Um, and the reason I chose this photograph is partly because I think it, it, uh, it, it, this is one of the same sequence taken. That there's a famous black eyed dog photo, which is him in this same alleyway with a dog going past him. But the reason I've chosen this one is because I, I go to this little corner a lot. This is one mm. of my standard walks I do on Hampstead Heath. You I know what they it. say about- <laughs> you know it all the time. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going dogging there. So anyway, swiftly moving on. So uh, we're, anyway, today that, we're, that's it. So today we're gonna to be talking about the legendary um, Nick Drake. And it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like we were, this is meant to happen because we've covered a lot of, um, um, you know, various musicians from this kind of time period. Um, and we did uh, Davy Graham recently. So it's really great to do, um, you know, Nick Drake, who was um, really, didn't really get famous until, you know, after his whole career happened. And um, and so we're going to, and, and Bob's really unique in this situation because Bob has actually seen him perform live. And I haven't met many people that have actually seen him perform. So it's going to be great to find that out. Um, and we're going to go and there's, there is a few actually YouTube, really good YouTube documentaries on um, Nick Drake. So I guess what we can do here on, on the guitar show is talk about the guitars as well. We can make, focus more on the guitars as well. But let's let's start off first, Bob, with um, um, let's start. If, I'll tell you what, if, if we start off, you know, how you first came across him, you know. and uh, OK, you well, the same, I came across him the same way as most people came across him back in the day. Uh, very few people would have come across him. Uh, by seeing him perform, and we'll go back to that. But uh, the reason is that in those days, the record companies had this really brilliant idea, which was they used to produce sampler LP records. And these samplers were basically one track culled off each of their roster of artists' releases. So I think the first company to do a sampler was probably Decca, and they did things like The World of Blues Power, and you'd know that because of all the mm -hmm. early yep. Clapton, John Mayall, Peter yeah. Green's Greeny for many years. Yep. That was the only vinyl record Greeny was released on. Mm -hmm. Until the days of CD, you had to buy the World of Blues Power volume. Had a great cover, didn't it? What? Well, it, blue, kind of dark blue. No, 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 it was some some uh, girl in in kind mm -hmm. of photo silhouette, you know, freaking out, baby. Um, <laughs> it was a pretty naff cover, actually. But oh, geez, oh. it was a fantastic album. And also, these things were sold cheap. They were loss leaders, right? So anyway, all these albums were being produced. The Decca did the first one, I think. CBS did one, did several. They did The Rock Machine, I Love You. The Rock Machine Turns You On. And then they did the famous one called Fill Your Head With Rock, which is a double album, full of stuff. And this is where you, kids like me discovered bands, right? Island Records followed suit. Their first one was called You Can All Join In, and it had fantastic things like um, Spooky Tooth and Spencer Davis Group and stuff. The second one, most important to this, was called Nice Enough to Eat. It was 14 shillings and 11 pence. That's 75 pence in modern British currency. So it was cheap. And it had Mott the Hoople. It had Free. It had Nick Drake. It had Fairport Convention. 
Uh, it was unbelievable, an incredible album. And of course, on that, I'm going to play it in the wrong tuning. Was Time Has Told Me, which was probably Nick Drake's most accessible sort of folky song. Um, and that's where I first heard that. Now, on this same record was 21st Century Schizoid Man by King Crimson, and nobody had heard anything like it, you know? So it was really something else. That's how I came across him. And, and so, you know, kids who were into that kind of music, they would all have been familiar with Nick Drake, but seeing him was hard work mm -hmm. because he was so let, very so introverted how, and he didn't play much. So how did you come across, you know, did you read about um, him in The Melody Maker? Did you... Is that how you came across the fact that he was touring? Because I know that Joe Boyd had put him on tour for a, a few dates. Yeah. And that was a tour that he actually walked out on, wasn't it, after a while? Yeah, he, 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 just, he just couldn't, he couldn't cut it. The, the, the reason was he was very, very introverted. And he couldn't handle a situation where the audience talked. And they were, you know, they were out for a night, you know, with a bit few beers and stuff. Even in folk clubs, you know, people were talking over him and he couldn't handle it. So he just he just retreated into his shell. Um, I can imagine that because the, uh, for Pink Moon, if I just play a little bit of Pink Moon, yeah. Um, this tuning here is um, basically C. G, C, F, C, E with a capital on the second fret. I know there's other ways you can do that, but you can imagine without, you know, having an electronic tuner like this I've got on the headstock. Can you imagine how hard that would be? To well, I, can, I mean, I can tell you from first-hand experience, you, you, you said in the intro that, that I saw him, and I did, and I only know one other guy who's also called Bob who saw him too. Now, I've been trying to work out where I saw him because it was definitely on the South Bank in London. I thought it was the mm -hmm. festival hall. But looking back through the literature, I think I saw him in the Queen Elizabeth Hall. Right. Um, uh, I saw him um, there, I think, with John and Beverly Martin, with whom he was very, very close friends. Uh, and John Martin, of course, wrote the tune Solid Air about him. Um, but I've looked back, and actually, I, I did go to see him twice in very short order, because I also saw him at the London Students' Union, London University Students' Union. And that was a gig and a half, because... That was two of my all-time favourites. That was the early Genesis, right? Three 12-string guitars and no electronic tuners and a manky Mellotron. And then at, supported by Nick Drake. But all the way through, you're right, he played these bizarre tunings. Every song's in a different tuning. They didn't have electronic tuners. So you, you, it, back in the day, you know, lots of folk singers used to change from G to D to Dadgad and stuff like that, but they always used to sell jokes while they were tuning. Nick didn't have any banter so he could take a minute or two to retune the guitar between songs it's totally lost his audience yeah i mean I, i've i've done you know i can relate to that because um you know when you see great sort of folk artists in england they always have the banter you know they always they, they're really great at tuning their guitar and, and talking and when, the when to... ralph mctell supported me ha 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 which he did once um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I won't live that down in a hurry. Um, he was exactly that. He only played three or four songs, but he had all the chat because it's yeah. what you did as a folk singer. It's part of that was yeah. part of learning your um, your craft. Yeah. And I think that he he was he obviously because if we talk a little bit about his background, you know, he he grew up in this beautiful house. It, it wasn't a mansion, but it, was, it wasn't far off, was it? I mean, um, it's a beautiful house in the West Country and. Uh, um, a typical so, sort of, it, it wasn't, yeah. but it could have been an old vicarage or an old rectory, one of those lovely houses, yeah. you know, beautiful yeah. Middle England, Midlands of England, lovely weather, plenty of countryside, yeah. lovely garden, roses mm -hmm. all over the house. And his, sis his sister was a sort of a, an, an actress or an actor of note. And, and you can imagine him just, you know, those, those, those kind of houses, they creak, you know, if you've ever been in one of those houses and you walk around, you can hear somebody down the, the landing walking because the boards creak you know so oh, you yeah. can imagine him being up at late at night um smoking a bit of a joint or whatever and i don't know if he did was allowed to do it at home but you can imagine him being just you know his parents are asleep and he's crawling around the house being very quiet you know yeah. and that was he was just a quiet sort of um guy that was his whole thing was but that he was quiet look, I, I i i better say i'm, I'm sitting here 
with you. I'm, I'm sitting with various bits of Nick, Nick Drake memorabilia, which I'll yeah. run through. But in particular, I've got a pile of books. There are five books written about Nick Drake that mm. are worth reading if you're interested. Um, Deeper Than the Darkest Sea. I'll put pictures of all of these up. Deeper Than the Darkest Sea. Um, Pink Moon by um, Gorm Henrik Rasmussen, which was actually the first book ever written about Pink Moon. It was written in Danish originally. Uh, the Pink Moon Files, which is a collection of all of the writings in the Pink Moon, P-Y-N-K, Moon fanzine that existed from the 90s through until the early 2000s. Um, Patrick Humphrey's uh, biography. And finally, uh, Remembered for a While, which is a compilation of people's memoirs of him. And th these, these five books, I mean, they're, they're six inches thick between them, and they've got all this stuff in them, and they've got lots of documentation about what you've just described, him living at home with his parents and stuff like yeah. that. But his upbringing was interesting. His parents were expatriates. They fled Burma during the mm. war. They actually fled to India. His father was a civil engineer. His mother, Molly, was uh, a couple of things very important. First of all, Nick Drake was a very, very good-looking, if very English public schoolboy type, but very good-looking boy. His mother, Molly, was an absolute beauty, an English rose. But also, she composed and performed her own songs yeah, on the piano. Yeah. And it, that came to light quite late, long after everybody had discovered and loved Nick Drake. And of course, there's lots of her and this whole English and English rosiness and this whole post-war yeah. golden years. It, it's, it's interwoven into his, the lyricality of his work. And she, and she was a great poet. She was a really good, she, she, you know, she wrote poems. Yeah. Um, so that, and he studied, obviously he studied, um, um, he read English at Cambridge, right? Was it Oxford uh, or Cambridge? He, 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 uh, yeah, he studied, he studied at Wellington and yes. then he, and then he went to Cambridge, but he only stayed Cambridge, a year, yeah. only stayed a year. Yeah. But he, he was doing English, wasn't he? He was, he went up to read English, English, but ended, ended up spending all his time playing, smoking dough, hanging out with <laughs> yeah. Robert Kirby, who wrote most of his string arrangements. Right. So another thing I want to say is uh, he's just talking about his guitar style. And this is, you know, as you know me and, and you know my style uh, and what I really look for in players is a great groove. And, and you know, this is the thing about Nick Drake. He had an incredible groove. Oh, yeah. So he's playing and he could just keep I'm not in tune, but he could just keep that thumb, you know. could just and you could and, and the way that when they were you know when they were producing him it was like you could put all the instruments around him afterwards because his groove was so in so again if you read any of the mags you read the books oh by the way there's one other piece of literature that anyone interested in nick drake has to find it was written by a man called ian mcdonald and it was a depth piece for q magazine mm -hmm. uh so it'll take a little looking up and for me it is the definitive piece on Nick Drake. It's absolutely extraordinary. Now, Ian McDonald was a great fan, but he was also a great music journalist, and it's very objective. It doesn't pull punches. It's fabulously written. Unfortunately, he died rather young too. Oh, um, so right. he's not with us anymore either. But it's so that and the five books are the definitive pieces on Nick Drake. Once you've read them, you've you've basically read the compilation of everything everybody knows. Everything else is just mm -hmm. speculation. Well, I mean, I first I first came across um, Nick Drake, and I don't know if you can put this photo up, um, Bob, when you do this, edit this. Um, but I first came across Nick Drake. I'd heard I'd heard him, and you know, just through the years. But the 1997 article in Mojo magazine, um, and that was really. I'm just wondering you know, just if reading I'm reading that article. I'm wondering if we're talking about the same thing, and I've got the magazine wrong because it would have been more Mojo than Q. It, it, this is probably the 1997 and I remember I mean, even my twin brother who's a bass player you know into you know Stanley Clark pretty Clark much the same. I think I think it's Mojo <laughs> I think you're right we read that and we were like it was the definitive article I think on Nick Drake so that but, was but had you heard him by then and if so how because you I you were likely to hear him on a on a, yeah. a telecoms or a chocolate commercial that's how a lot him. of people heard of him well whenever you play guitar and you I used to read the guitar mm -hmm. magazines everybody would name check him and and, and I'd heard pieces and I'd probably heard a piece and thought, yeah, that's nice. But I wouldn't didn't really dig beneath the, the surface because I was really into blues and jazz at that time. But then after reading that article, that sold me. And I was like, then I started 
digging deeper and really listening to his music and especially you know pink moon is my one of my favorite songs of all time um but um that was the article and i think and if you know if you can get that article i don't know if you can get it online maybe we can put a link in if you yeah can. i'll look it up i'll look it up but that will be that's the definitive article it is I the think, definitive personally. article and actually if you've if you've only got like 25 minutes to read up on nick drake that's the one to do i mean all the books take hours but that article yeah. it's the bollocks it is fantastic so coming back to his guitar style, I mean, yes. obviously he kind of grew up playing Donovan and Dylan covers and you can hear a bit of Dylan, you know, his vocal delivery has yes. got very sort of Dylan-esque sort of delivery, but, but his guitar style is very interesting. Um, it's amazing. And I didn't, re- yeah, I yeah. didn't really, this is one thing I didn't research who, you know, on, on terms, I mean, it could be, was he into like Big Bill Brunzi? Cause you know, Big Bill Brunzi um, with, um, let me, let me, uh, oh, on the can't tune up but big, you know that big bill brunzi had that sort of four to the floor you know crotchet thing going as well and yep. you know who, i wonder who his influences were you know because that's one thing i didn't really sort of research before this video but i, I would imagine that you know david graham I, I reckon he would have learned angie i bet you anything he would have been able to play Angie. pretty much everybody did didn't they yes yeah and you know so and and david graham was a great sort of picker and you know, um, so, you know, and, and you, very, know, you would have yeah. had the guys, you would have had the guys in Pentangle, you would have had um, John Renborn and uh, John Bert Yansh. Bert Yansh, Bert, yeah. Bert Yansh. I mean, they would have been influential. Yeah. I mean, basically, but you're right, all of these guys, they were in turn taking their direction from mm. the American players. So you had the whole folk boom, the whole Seeger yeah. boom, and then the blues boom. Seeger. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the acoustic blues boom. So, so you know, th- that, that would have been their, their references, yeah. Yeah, like Lead Belly and Big Bull Brunzi. Big Bull Brunzi had obviously been brought over yeah. to England on tours. And and I, and I can, you know, really interesting. I'm just going to read you this because this is something I found out. And I don't know if you know this. You probably know this because you read the, the books, but check this out. Um, where are we? Nick and his friends went down for a meal in the French quarter of Marrakesh in Morocco. As they sat down, they noticed the trademark floppy hat of celebrity ph- photographer Cecil Beaton. With him were Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, and Keith's girlfriend, Anita Pallenberg, and several other assorted stones and hangers on. Richard Charkin says that Nick and his friends were astonished. They'd come over a thousand miles from home to immerse themselves in Moroccan culture, only to find themselves in a restaurant with the apostles of the counterculture. Fueled by some cheap local wine, they told the rock star party that they should hear their friend. And so it was that the Rolling Stones sat and listened as an 18-year-old Nick Drake serenaded them with the selection of Dylan and Donovan covers. <laughs> I mean, what are the odds of that? You know, so that was before he even became... Well, the funny thing is, you in know, those days, if you were, you know, white British, probably, you know, moneyed or upper middle class or something... First of all, you know, going to Marrakesh was not, you know, your weekend destination like it is now. It was quite an exotic destination. You had to kind of know what you were doing. And if you did go to Marrakesh and you bumped into some other white people, the chances are they were people like you. And it so, was, well, the, yeah, there was know, some very ways, interesting, yeah. It's, it's, it seems improbable, but actually the odds, mm. when you look at the circumstance, once you're in Marrakesh, the odds close down quite, quite quickly. Yeah, you had very a lot of famous photographers. Even you know um, people like Kenneth Williams used to holiday holiday down there, and you know all the kind of eccentrics would go there. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. know that raised an eyebrow there, but <laughs> for the eccentrics, it was it was it was um, you know it was a place of uh, mystique and mysterious, and you know Jimi Hendrix went there as well. Fantastic place. I mean, I, you know, I didn't go there until. Till maybe 2000 or something like that, you know, way later when it was really commercialized. But I still think it's one of my favorite yeah. places in the world, Marrakesh. But I mean, you, oh, I it, yeah. you've been all over the shop in, in Northern Africa. I lived there. Yeah, I lived in Marrakesh uh, for a couple of years on and off. But um, yeah, and, and also, you know, Robert Plant, he's, Robert Plant is his favorite place. So it's interesting that he, he went there and he had this kind of Brian Jones, obviously, made an album first world music album there for EMI. Yeah. But yeah, but it, this is another thing where, you know, th- this he's a thinking man he's he's an intellectual nick drake is an intellectual oh yeah because um apparently i was telling you to, earlier today before we did this he even went for a job when his music career had failed he even went for a job as a computer programmer and passed and got the job okay he, he later left it 
um, after the, they were sent in for training. But he actually, you know, passed the test to become a computer programmer. I think, so the guys, I think the, you know. the, the other thing you have to understand, and I've got a, a tiny bit of empathy with the guy because he and I, he's, he, you know, he was a little bit older than me, born a little early, but we both went to fairly well-known, significant English public schools, privileged education, boarding schools, all boys, all this stuff. The importance of academia, the importance of sport, the importance of this extracurricular intellectual stuff. You know, so I mean, I'm sure that Wellington would have been different to my school, which was Oundle, but uh, th there would have been many similarities, many similarities in the way the place is operated, the kind of discipline they were throwing. Yeah, you had a house, didn't you? You, know, you, you, you had a house. house. I mean, bas basically, my, my school was about 720 boys divided into about a dozen boarding houses, so about 60 boys in a house. And I think he was, a, he was a head head of the house or whatever so i think he, he was... became the head of his house yeah. yes i think he yeah. did he was a, he was a pretty successful and popular pupil mm -hmm. he was quite successful at sport he was tall he could run fast so you know so so here's a guy that's kind of you know he's 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 got this great background he's you know and and all he and so really i guess the, he, the pressure was himself he put his own pressure on himself to and, and he kind of entered obviously signing to Island Records via Joe Boyd and, you know, Chris Blackwell, you know, and they did had some great successes, um, obviously. Um, oh, Island was probably the hot label, certainly the hot English label of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the major acts were on it. Yeah. Most of the major, and, what you'd now call prog. So whether it was prog folk or prog rock, most of those acts were on Island. They had, they had a, yeah. a, 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 an unfair share Given they were quite a small record company, they had an unfair share of the market. Yeah, and and um, you know there was a lot of other um, because obviously uh, Cat Stevens was on yeah, Island, yeah. wasn't he? So yeah, Cat Stevens. Right. So so they had a kind of model for these. Um, I think John Martin was there. Yeah, Sandy that's right. Denny. So they had this kind of model to you know an understanding of the British folk artist. You know, and if anyone yeah. could sell the music, it, it was you know Chris Blackwell. And also, and, um, by the way, a lot of cross cross pollination. I've already said, you know, that, that, uh, that John Martin and Nick Drake were firm friends, and John right. Martin's wife of the time, John uh, Beverly. Oh, really? Uh, as well, wow. um, right? Because John Martin's first two albums for Island, the first one was on in in mono. Yeah. Um, I think that was called London Conversation. Yep. The second one was called The Tumbler. It was in stereo, and then he did two albums. Uh, Stormbringer and The Road to Ruin with, with him and Beverly as a unit, John and Beverly Martin. And right. then they split up, went their own ways. He went on to begin to do the kind of echoey stuff that he became famous for, so Bless the Weather. And then he did the great famous Solid Air, whose title track was written about his deteriorating friend, Nick Drake. Wow. And also and on, on Five Leaves Left, if you look at the credits carefully, you'll see that the electric guitar on Time Has Told Me is played by one Richard Thompson. Really? And then if you look you on Brighter Later, the electric mm -hmm. band album, you'll see Dave Mattox and Dave Pegg, I think it is, the, the bass player and drummer of Fairport, pretty much all across mm -hmm. it, along, yes. with, along with a guest appearance from John Cale. Well, John Cale was on Island as well, wasn't he? Yeah. He was a, so I guess it was kind of using their own artists. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and, but, but unfortunately for Nick... Drake, he was actually the poorest selling of the lot of all, all, all of those artists. He was a disaster. Yeah. I mean, actually, there are he parallels was, yeah. drawn with um, another of Joe Boyd's protégés, Vashti Bunyan, who was mm -hmm. a very uh, beautiful, although she, you know, but going by her name, she wasn't very English at all, but she was a very English rose type of mm -hmm. that era. Beautiful, beautiful voice, folk singing stuff. And her first album sold 200 copies. And Nick Drake bettered that, but not by much. So mm -hmm. and we, get, we go in two directions here. First of all, just um, staying with his guitar style for a minute. If you read any of the books, you read, um, uh, uh, God, I've forgotten his name now, uh, the guy uh, uh, who recorded him uh, at Sound Techniques. Uh, it'll come back John, to me. Was it John? No. John um, Wood. John, John Wood, Wood yeah. yeah. And he said that Nick Drake, every take was perfect. Right. Every yes. take. I, you can hear it. You can you hear it in his playing. Yeah, and so back to your point about, you know, that rhythm and that groove. He said every take was perfect. He'd worked yeah. out these parts in such detail and he'd practiced them yeah. to such a high level. Every take was exactly the same. So you, you, you took a few takes for the hell of it. You didn't need to. Every take was perfect. Um, 
but then you get on to the commercial success or not of these records and i mean th th this this was what basically led to his his disappointment that's the word you know he'd come out of uh, uh, an upper middle class loving family background public school education where he'd been a successful fated boy at the school mm -hmm. uh, a good time at cambridge so, and, so and and so you know and, and suddenly he's going into the music business and he's having to go out to these folk clubs and compete and all the rest of it and he's just not cutting it and his albums aren't selling Mm. And to cut a long story short, across his very short career, you know, by 1971, the man has got fairly serious mental illness going on. Whether or not that was exacerbated mm -hmm. by the enormous amount of spliff that he consumed, I don't know. Well, uh, you know, and, and, and obviously with the guitar show, but I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm, I'm big into poetry, especially of um, sort of decadent poets um, such as... Um, you know Oscar Wilde and and so forth and, and and I know that he was a really big fan he must have been a big fan of Byron and Keats and you know obviously reading English at um, Cambridge yeah. he would have he would have been very well read but he would have had a lot of exposure to that yeah you know and you can yeah. hear that you can really hear that sort of poetry in his his um, although writing. I mean going back to that gig I saw you know where you had Genesis mm -hmm. and uh, Nick Drake on the same bill yeah Nick Drake by the way performing excruciatingly as ever looking at yes. looking at his feet all the time mm -hmm. um, and not interacting with the audience. But Genesis, their first couple of albums were all about mythology. Mm -hmm. that were, sorry, that actually their second and third album, to be more precise, mm -hmm. were heavily mythologically based. Also public school boys, by the way, from Charterhouse School. Nick Drake doesn't carry any of these poetic allusions into his writings. The, the guitar I'm holding is the guitar on the cover of Brighter Later, right? It's a Guild Economy M20. This one's from 1964. It took me forever to find. I always wanted one because it was on the cover of Brighter Later. Um, of course, he never played it. It was actually in the studio where they were doing the shoot. I think it might have had a relationship with Eric Clapton or one of his retinue back then. Um, and they literally borrowed it for the shoot. So that, which um, was it in the recording studio? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they borrowed it for the shoot. So, you know, but I always wanted one of these guitars like I always wanted my Epiphone Texan because I used to worship Al Stewart, another folky from back in and the Paul day with a rather less appealing voice. And Paul McCartney. Uh, and Paul McCartney. Yes, egg and chips. Egg and, egg and, egg and, egg and chips. <laughs> Yeah, but I've actually played that guitar, guys, and it's light as a feather. It's almost like it's going to float in the air. Yeah, it's very. It's, nothing. it's not a romantic sort of guitar, as in, you know the classical romantic guitars, but it's very small and compact, and the neck is tiny, isn't it? Very delicate it's, it's, sort of guitar. It's quite, it's quite small, but I mean, you still you can still play it, and it's it's really it's, it's mellow. <laughs> Of the whole song, yeah. Now, the view, so, viewers, might, viewers might have a view about that. Okay, I just wanted to demonstrate that sound, and that was obviously me playing River Man. I'm, I was playing in standard tuning with a capo on the third fret to bring it into a kind of C add two as a starting chord. But I have no idea if he played that in one of his weird tunings as well. He probably did, in which case, all my voicings are a bit off. Right. I mean, you know, for me, I mean, what, what I liked about his, his, his rhythm, he, he was an, even with when he was strumming. Yeah. You know, the, all, all, the syncopation is just. You know, just, just yeah. beautiful, precise playing and. Absolutely. And he, just had, and, and he was very tidy, very clean, you know. Yes. The, you know very t tidy and clean wasn't he so on on your favorite album pink moon there's a track called things behind the sun and you listen to the guitar part on that and it's not easy it's really complicated mainly what the right hand is doing to your point and it's as tidy as anything it's every time he plays it it's served up dressed for dinner it's perfect well, this is one of the reasons why I play this is because I know that he had a Martin D twenty eight, right? That was his, that was his main recording guitar. Was a you know that was his main guitar was a Martin, right? Well, you see, it, I, when, it wasn't when, a D eighteen, was it? Sorry, it was, a, it was a, 
It was a Martin D28, not a Martin D18. Okay. As far as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, don't, I could be wrong. Okay. I mean, I mean, <laughs> should have, I, I should have researched this. See, see, I, I never saw him play with a Martin. You see, when, when I saw him playing, he was playing things like Levin's. You right. Know, okay. which, you know, these guitars, they were, they were pretty in England at the time, you know, things like Levin's and Hagstrom's were pretty, pretty abundant. You know, they were kind yeah. of hangover from the, the fifties where American instruments were hard to get here because there was a kind of, it wasn't a trade yeah. embargo, but it was something governmental and technical like that. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and, can we, we and, can we put a photo of the Levin guitar when you cut this up? Uh, I, ca- I the funny thing is I looked up this morning and I couldn't find. I found a picture of him playing something that looked like a Levin, but it wasn't a Levin. The logo was exa- uh, almost exactly the same. But he used to play some really quite. Uh, it, 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 no, it'd be patronising to call them cheap, but I mean, you know, uh, unremarkable import guitars. Um, so you know, I didn't, I didn't, I never saw him playing with a Martin. I didn't even know he played one. I know, I know, know John Martin played one, and I know he played John Martin's a lot. But you know, I mean, he certainly should have played a Martin. Um, but you know, I, I, but I again, he, he had this. It. He might have sold it, but I know he did have a Martin D twenty eight, and he had a Spanish guitar as well, didn't he? he That's right. That's right. Spanish. He used to play that a lot. You know, with a wide, wide flat neck, nylon strings, mm. and again, that yeah. wasn't like you know your Ramirez or anything spanky. It was probably. Pretty cheap shop board, ordinary instrument, but my God, well, he could play it. Well, Richard Thompson, who accompanied Nick in his first two albums, said, I only ever saw Nick play his small body guild guitar. That's from Richard Thompson. Okay. But he, but so, it's interesting because, I mean, the mythology, you know, that, that points towards this thing. And yet, mm-hmm. you know, all the mythology says that this was only brought into the room Hold that one, Nick. We'll take a photograph of you with those shoes off your feet in front of you, sitting down. And it was the characteristic, by the way, his mm-hmm. whole kind of hunched persona. That that's pretty accurately uh-huh. what what you got to see when he was on stage. It was quite uncomfortable. Well, well, can I quote Robert Kirby? I only remember a Martin D twenty eight and his Spanish guitar. This is not to say he did not have others. I think he sold the D twenty eight after Pink Moon. Yeah. But before the last four songs, in part exchange for the smaller triple O fifteen, or was it a triple O eighteen D eighteen? Okay, all right. Brian Wells has his Martin, and Gabriella still has his Spanish. You know, I mean, you can hear on Pink Moon, you can hear that bass, which would sort of denote it. It was a dreadnought. Yeah, you can really hear the bass sort of yeah. frequencies on, yeah. on that, that sort of um, style. But you know? also, I mean, you know, like like his voice. You know, it was very almost like like a, like a tone with the treble rolled right off. It was very very mm. mellow and smooth. So the way he played guitar, there, there was this incredible percussion and accuracy, but there was no real brightness and spark and attack. And actually, he was famous for playing very dirty strings. So you know, nothing wrong was, with that. It was this whole kind of mellow thing. And of course, you know, in the later in later stages of his life, you know, when he was really being gripped by depression, I mean, he he quite often he didn't he didn't live a very clean life. You know, he was he was pretty filthy most of the time. Sometimes people said, he, you know, his his nails were like an inch long, and you couldn't possibly play the guitar with them; they were too long and dirty and all that stuff. You know, he was a depressive mess. Yeah, and apparently he even I mean I don't know if this is true, and maybe it's not my place to say this, but apparently he had ECT. And he'd already tried to take his life with um, Valium already, you know, before he did actually, because, you know, they, the, you know, the general consensus is that it was an accident. He's final, um, you know, when he got up late at night and he um, went to make some cornflakes and, um, and he took some pills that he was currently on, that currently prescribed, but they hadn't known that if you took too many, you could actually die from it, you know, and he didn't right. know that. And he, he sort of took a, a stronger dose than normal and that's why he uh died but so obviously you know um nowadays it, it's much more acceptable to deal with mental health whereas i think in his time it was more kind of stiff up stiff upper lip um it certainly was get on with it it certainly was especially amongst men like it still is now and especially especially amongst what i'm going to call upper middle class english men the officer class, if you like, of a generation previously, you did not admit to this stuff. You, you know, you, you were, 
you were admitting failure if you if you admitted to this stuff. That was the 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 environment in which he he was clearly brought up, even mm -hmm. though he had a loving family. I mean, there's no you know these days it seems like everybody on this planet except me seems to have suffered abuse. There's no sense of any abuse at all. He had a, a, a loving, supportive family, as far as anyone can tell. Um, and yet. Yeah, it, you know, it just happens. And, and, but and I've used the word before. Yeah. I mean, the word for me, you know, I, I've been a fan of Nick Drake since I was 13 years old, and I'm now 350. And, you know, and I've read all these books, and I've listened to all his records, and I listened to all these records. I remember where I was when he when it was announced he died. I was actually sitting at my first desk and my first job in a London ad agency. And it came through on the radio we had on in the office. I literally, I, st I, I, I didn't start start bawling, but I, I got right. wet eyes. Um, it's kind it, of the JFK uh, moment. Yeah, and, the then, moment. and then this morning, just preparing for this little session, I was just getting my, finding where I'd put my books. And I got right. them out and I was just thumbing through one or two of them to just recap on a few facts. And yep. on Radio Paradise, which is the most amazing internet radio station that I listen to mm. all the time, I think it's bloody fantastic. Um, and what happens? Nick Drake. Nick Drake. Yeah. It's Sandra. And I had I had a I had a moist eye again. I thought, oh yeah. God, you know, it, I don't get that way about much music. I I get I get that feeling under my rib cage when I hear a really great electric guitar player really, mm -hmm. really on fire. But I don't yeah. get this from many people, but Nick Drake hits my spot every time. And I think you need to be a little bit of a, an intelligent listener because it's kind of like, it's so, um, it, it's, it's like wine. It's like a fine wine. You know, you need to develop a taste for wine before you can appreciate a fine wine. And I think Nick Drake's music's like that. It, it, you don't just discover Nick Drake as soon as you get into music. It's, it's, um, you, you'll discover it when you're ready. <laughs> and yeah. And I think the, the, the fascinating you'll appreciate, thing, you know, the fascinating like Paul thing Weller is, said, Paul Weller said that actually, because right. he, uh, he, he, he discovered Nick Drake later. Okay. And he probably so, wasn't ready to, to, so, you know, you're probably right. Um, but, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting that, that he, he sold, he sold a few thousand albums in total while he was alive, made three mm. albums, by the way, all three Which of those pretty, albums. Pretty, it's pretty impressive by 26. It's, it's, it's impressive. Well, well, three I mean, albums out. Yeah, but I know back in those days. I mean, you know, honestly, bands used to tour, record, tour, record. Mm. It was it wasn't unusual for an album to produce more than one album a year. And to Chris Black, and and to Chris Blackwell's, um, what's the word? Um, credit, credit. He didn't just you know nowadays they just say right you failed on your first album see you later go out the door. He, no, no, Drake absolutely right. To, they to they used to try and nourish their artists. And, and, and yeah. uh, interestingly, I, I read um, on one thing online today that one of the reasons that Nick Drake's cat, uh, his, his records have always been in circulation is because Joe Boyd insisted that however few they were selling, there was always a current pressing available for the few people who wanted to come to it. But what I was going to say was that uh, Nick Drake's three albums, he only recorded three albums, and as you just alluded to, four songs subsequently which are very dark but the three albums are all in rolling stones top 100 albums of all time now i haven't looked through the list so i'm not sure how many other artists have got three albums in that list but if you think about it the math says there can't be more than 30 <laughs> if everybody's got three albums in the list so it's very few yeah and the other thing is i don't think there's anyone else in the world who's got all the albums they ever made yeah, in that absolutely. top 100. That is an unbelievable achievement. And of course, what happened is, you know, I, he's, as I say, he sold a few thousand albums during his lifetime, and that disappointment mm -hmm. weighed on him so heavily that it probably got him. But since then, hundreds of thousands of people have yeah. taken an interest in him, have been knocked out by him, worship him, follow him, bought the albums hundreds of thousands it's it's a really remarkable achievement it's very sad but it's very very it's also it's uplifting yeah it is i mean and and when you listen like i said for me i'm a uh, my whole thing my whole game as a you know i don't bring myself into this but i'm a groove man you know i like the groove I, my twin brother's an incredible i think he's one of you know easily in the top 10 bass players in england 
and the reason he's so good is because he's, he's got a better groove than anybody, you know, and it, it comes down to having a groove. And Nick Drake's, that's the first thing I heard was like, that's an incredible groove. Yeah. Where's that come from? You don't yeah. really hear that with folk players. I mean, you know, obviously Richard Thompson's killer, killer groove, you know, he's, he's got it, you know, but just hearing that solid, real solid playing, it's yeah. not, normally it's a little bit, ooh, you know, yeah, no, I, I mean, edges, although you know, although but... Richard would have been um, would have been Nick's senior uh, at the time, I'm pretty right. sure that I'm pretty sure that Nick would have left a, a, a lasting impression on Richard when they played together. Absolutely, it's probably, probably mutual, wasn't it? It was probably mutual. Yeah, it was yeah, absolutely. Thing, you know, and you know, see, but... both of them were you know quite assiduously going after an English sound. There was no affectation of an American sound at all. And Richard Thompson mm -hmm. is one of the most famous English, English guitarists, yes. you know, yeah. uh, and he's held that together all his life. And I, it, it, Nick Drake was very definitely that you listen to his music and that music is English. It ain't from nowhere else. It's English, but I can hear a little bit of blues. I can hear a little bit of oh, blues. I'm sure. Oh, well, know. I mean, my favourite one of all, you know, went at the very end of Riverman, which yeah. is probably that that's the track that actually gives me the cold chills, mm -hmm. you know, down the back of my neck every time I hear it, I can guarantee it. And at the very end, when he sings, oh, how they come and go, oh, how they come and go. And that's a blues riff, right? It's yeah. that. He's singing that, but he sings it so smoothly and sweetly and modulates it that you you think, oh, this is lovely and folky and gorgeous. And you go, yeah, I've just been, I've just been caught by a blues riff. It's a solid vocal blues riff. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Uh, and he's timing, he's timing with the vocal phrases. Oh. It's impeccable. Because he'll come in on a on the off beat, he won't come in on the downbeat like the predictable, yeah. and he, and he'll he'll drag the phrase, he'll sustain a note, yeah, and then come in on another syncopation. So it's yeah. very syncopated. It's very um, very clever stuff. He know, really understood stuff. the rhythm. The other the other thing is, I mean, you know, he he used he used to play Riverman, you know, mm -hmm. to, to small audiences, and Riverman's in five. So I can play Riverman, and I can, well, I can't sing at all. Can't sing for Toffee, but I can sing it after a fashion. Play them together. You must be joking. Mm. Can't do it. Just can't think, do it. And I think maybe, maybe this is the thing is his last, I think his last four songs that he recorded or something, I don't think he played and sang at the same time. I think he did them separate. So obviously he wasn't playing. He wasn't, he wasn't on his game by the, the sort of the, the end. He, he was having to, you know, whereas before, yeah, on the first three albums, whatever, he was, you know, he was singing and playing together, one two takes, you know, doing the whole album. In again, John Wood just said he was it, once he decided how he was going to play something, he would play it again and again and again and again. It would it, you could almost lay the lay them yeah. on each other and see no variation. Amazing, but yeah, quite brilliant. And, and his tempo was just really, really good. So that's that's really. Um, I think I think we've covered most of it. Just the the guitar, the guitars themselves. Well, look, I'm that. I'm going to do I'm going to put one other thing, which I'll talk about briefly here. I'm I'm also going to just um, cut away while I'm talking now to a photograph. Um, uh, so uh, there was a guy. I think his name was Oh God, I've forgotten his name again. Morris something Morris, who was the guy who photographed Nick Drake for all his albums, and he's unfortunately passed away quite recently too. Um, it's going to happen to all of us, isn't it? Anyway, uh, there was a an exhibition at a sale of his work about 10 or 15 years ago. And it was actually exactly the same weekend as this arrived. So I had a real Nick Drake weekend. I bought um, a one of the limited edition of 25 of the, in, the inside artwork for uh, Five Leaves Left. So the picture of him at Morris's table in his country farmhouse that black and white picture. And that's sitting, looking at me uh, down from the wall. The other thing is I might well um, fade out to um, a recording I made of one of Nick Drake's instrumentals. Um, I was lucky enough to record uh, quite a few years ago in Abbey Road. And the guys said, have you got anything you want to lay down while you're here? And I'm kind of going like a child in a bloody toy shop. I'm just going, well, <laughs> yeah. And I suddenly thought, what would I like to record most? And so I recorded a piece. Um, this is off uh, Pink Moon as well. It's called Horn. Um, and I recorded that. So I'll, I'll probably use that as the, uh, the fade out on this, just for a bit of relevant, topical, what have you.
Wonderful. Okay, then, guys. Well, that's it for this um, sort of special edition of Bob and Ron Show. And, uh, yeah. We'll Quite a departure for us, actually. It is. It is. Yeah. It is. We'll see you soon, guys. Take care. Bye. All the best. Bye-bye.